Okay, sorry about that. I had an audio issue and thankfully somebody caught me before I messed it up. Um, so again, the purpose of this study is to, first of all, identify the process required to do this using QGIS um, and then hopefully can turn that into uh, something more automated sometime down the road so that you can like build the entire system in QGIS and then it automatically splits your domains for you where you want them to be split. So that's kind of the idea, but I've had a couple of people come to me wanting to split their projects up and I have a and I have a feeling that some of them have been wanting to split their projects up not because they need to but because they're using Mapper as their mapping tool and Mapper is running out of memory. So let's start with project size. Oh, by the way, I also wanted to say that I used a couple of these the methods from these two um, guys right here to, to build the elevation data for this project. So let's take a quick look at it. So that that's pretty that was handy. I'm glad that I did that because I learned how to get this data from that USGS website and and how to uh, you know get it into the data format that I need. So this is the project area and it has this project domain is about 20 square miles. Now 20 square miles at 20 by 20 foot cell size is around 1.5 million cells, which is kind of like the perfect cell size for Flow 2D. Um, you could build this project in GDS and you, it would probably be slow and kind of a pain, but you could do this project in QGIS, I'm sorry, in GDS, but you probably couldn't do it in Mapper. So if you went to map it, you would very likely run out of memory. So I think that's why I was asked to review a uh, domain exchange for this project. And I agreed because I had also wanted to do a domain exchange on a more complex project. So we're going to use this today to, you know, identify a couple of things about domain exchange that kind of hopefully, you know, make this easier. Uh, but in reality, if I was doing this in QGIS, I wouldn't split this into to multiple domains because it's perfect for 1.5 million cells. It's a perfect project size for Flow2D. Some people in Flow2D are going up to, I've seen projects as high as uh, 4 million cells in the United States. And then outside the United States, I've seen them up to like 11 million cells. So it kind of depends on what you want to put into it and how much area you want to model. In the Flood Control District of Maricopa County, they split domains uh, and they do try to use about 1.5 million to 2 million as kind of their um, like size of their projects. And they do split domains along hydraulically, uh, I guess, natural hydraulic splits. And that's what we're going to try to do today. So let me see. Okay, so project size is. Uh, so the first thing that I did when I built this is I used this um, this domain right here, and I just made the full project at 50 foot cell size. I just take the uh, domain 100, or sorry, created the grid, set the project size to 50 feet, processed the elevation, and I ran the rainfall. And I didn't do anything special. So that took what, like maybe after I got the elevation data, you know, put together, that takes like maybe two to five minutes to process that and export that and start that run. So that's perfect because uh, you don't have to, um, you know, you don't have to, you get a lot of information out of that with a little bit of work. And what that gave me was, I'm sorry, I, had, I loaded these three guys into the wrong layer, into the wrong QGIS. So we're going to have to bounce back and forth a little bit. But what that gave me is this map right here, the full domain, the full domain. And when I ran it, I went ahead and run it at a 0.5 hour uh, interval so that I can come in here and review what's happening, where the water is crossing specific paths so that I can use this to define my domain. And what I decided to do in this is to split the domain along this uh, freeway boundary because freeways are perfect boundaries um, because they kind of control the way that water flows. It also, in addition to a freeway, it also has 
a railroad grade along it. So I used that to identify the domain. Now I'm going to, let's see, let's grab a shape file so you can see that. I'm going to move this out of the way. Let's see, now we need our questions. I don't wanna move my questions out of the way just in case something happens and you guys need to get my attention. But I can move, I'm just working off screen for a second to pull a shape file on here. So this is the south domain. Okay, and so what I did with the south domain is I used it to, here's your north domain. I used this polygon of the south domain to just, to um, as, as like a cookie cutter, right? It's actually the cookie cutter is the north domain, not the south domain. But you, but what you can see here is if you're looking at this um, this this uh, depth map, and you add, let me do something real quick. You add the velocity vectors to it, then you can kind of uh, identify. First of all, let's see. Let's get rid of that. You can kind of identify where the water is crossing the grid. And let's put this just under here. See, you can kind of easily identify where the water is crossing the freeway. And the freeway will be the downstream end of our project, but not just the, uh, the freeway, but just slightly south of the freeway so that we aren't, so that our, um, our interface isn't uh, impacted by the what you know the freeway the swales uh the the railroad grade and things like that it's just it's more of a pure boundary so it's slightly away from the freeway to the south and you can see that the water is pretty clearly crossing that boundary on this part of the project and as well as in this area so i use this as the way to identify where I can split up the project into two different boundaries. Okay, so what we'll do now is we'll take, I'm gonna go ahead and pop this off of here. It shouldn't help, it shouldn't hurt it to move it, but I wanna make sure that I can edit it. And we're gonna go back to the other map. So this is the north domain. So the first thing I did after I did the full project is I confined the north domain to, oops, sorry, I'm off. Uh, I don't want to be on that. Let me get on the pan. I confined the north domain to the area just south of the freeway. And I wasn't super careful with it because I didn't need to be super careful with it. So I just, as long as I was south of the freeway, I was pretty happy with it. And I did use those velocity vectors and um, and the, and that, let me show you what I mean. This, um, see how things are kind of moving along in time as it drains, I did use that to kind of help guide me on where to put the boundary while I was making um, the north domain uh, southern boundary right here. Okay, and then once you do that, you create your grid, right? So let's take a look at the grid. So here's the grid along the boundary, and this, so, and, and you know I started with my full domain had a 50 by 50, but that was a mistake because 50 by 50 and 20 by 20 don't, um, they don't align very well. So what I found is that if you want to reduce the size of a domain, you need to start at something that, you know, uh, can align. So 20 by 20 can align to 60 by 60, it can align to 100 by 100, it can align to 80 by 80, but it doesn't align very well to 50 by 50. So I found that or that was a mistake doing 50 by 50. So I changed my grid cell size or this uh, computational domain grid cell size in the north to 20 by 20. I'm sorry, <laughs> to 60 by 60. Don't get confused. There's gonna be a lot of things going on here today. So I'm gonna show you that. If you open the computational domain, you see the cell size is 60 by 60. And then I recalculated the grid and reprocessed the elevation. Redid the rainfall. Now. When I'm testing all of this, there's a couple of things I don't care about. I don't care about infiltration. I don't care about um, the length of the project. I don't care about how much rainfall is falling on the grid because 
what I care about is where is the water going and how fast can I get this to run? So rather than setting up a 24 hour rainfall event, I set up a six hour rainfall event and I ran the whole thing for 10 hours. So that way I wasn't sitting here waiting for a long time for this process so that I could get my results. I, you know, I, I, I don't have to run it for 24 hours to get the results and to un identify the boundary. So shorten that time for yourself by utilizing this is just fake rainfall and it's a six hour pattern. You, we, there's even a two hour pattern, but I didn't think that was a very good, two hours wasn't good for this project because I need that water to get down here and cross this boundary. That, that was the idea. So six hours seemed to be pretty good. Now watch this, this is kind of cool. Okay, uh, so let's see, how did I do this? Now we take this guy right here, uh, the South Domain, and see how it overlaps? Very randomly overlaps. There's nothing special about this. And then we take a difference analysis between these two layers. And that's a pro that's in your processing toolbox. So if you open your processing toolbox or you can go to your vector analysis and you should see that. And that one makes it a little bit better because you can see some um, kind of icons here that tell you what's happening. So if you do a difference and your south domain is your input layer, that's the one you want to change, and your overlay over layer is the grid, and then you what you get out of that is a difference layer. So I'm going to run that to show you how fast that process is. Okay. Now what that has done is that has taken this. Uh, polygon and cut it and used the grid as a cookie cutter to cut the uh, pattern to exactly match the grid. That's the key. So let's go ahead and zoom in on this so that you can see it. I'm going to zoom in on this and then I'm going to remove the south domain. And I'm also going to turn off something else. Just give me a second because I don't want you to focus on the boundary conditions just yet. I want you to focus on the grid. And I'm going also going to turn off the computational domain because I don't want you to focus on the computational domain either. And let's just turn the elevation and the satellite off because we don't need that either. So now what we want to focus on is um, this guy and how it exactly aligned to the grid. And now we can use this to set our um, alignment of our 20 foot grid. So we got a 60 up here, we're going to use 20 down here. So that means that this needs to cover, this needs to overlap by one cell. Okay, because if I overlap it by one of the of the 60 foot cells, then I'm gonna have three deep inflow nodes. I don't want three deep inflow nodes. I want one deep inflow nodes on this boundary. And you're gonna understand what that means as soon as we see the process. So what you wanna do is uh, take this map and turn on the editor, and then you're going to want to move this polygon. So we're going to use the move tool, but this is an advanced editor toolbar, so you may not see it. So if you don't see it, you just go to uh, right click in your toolbar area, come down to toolbars, and you'll see you have the advanced digitizing toolbar. It's pretty handy. It's a completely useful toolbar for like splitting and merging polygons and lines and stuff. It's a great. And then you pick it up just by clicking it. And now you can see that you can move it anywhere. But I'm not going now if you and if, and if you messed up, like you put it right there, just control Z. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to align it about a third of the way up about a third of the way up and you can zoom in so you can really kind of identify like a good alignment and it doesn't have to be perfect it just has to overlap by one of the 20 foot cells not one of the 60 foot cells okay and i'll click that maybe i don't like that so much so maybe i'll try that again just pick it up 
And again, it doesn't have to be perfect and that's fine. And that's all you have to do. And now we save it and we turn off the editor. And this is, well, this is going to be our domain, our do where our domain uh, crosses and starts to share with the north. Of course, it's only going to be north feeding south at this point. It's not going to be south feeding north. There's not going to be an exchange uh, from the south to the north because the water is only flowing in one direction. Now we have to uh, polish up the edges of this guy, and we're going to do that right now. So what we want to do now is take it. Actually, I, I shouldn't have turned off the editor. Take Turn the editor back on, and this time we want the vertex tool. And if I click on that, and then you can see, we need to kind of clean up these vertices. So first thing I'll do is I will add, um, let's see, what do we want to take it down here? I think we can just, let's just see how it works. We can move this one down here. Shouldn't hurt anything. And then we can just select these guys and delete them. And then we'll just delete the rest of these as we see fit. I think now we can just have these guys right here and that seems perfect to me. Now we may want to, I think the rest of it's okay. Um, because this will be the top alignment right here and this will be out of the way. One thing you can do is you can align this to the top as well if you wanted. Uh, looks like I might have brought it in here a little bit. And then that's a little bit better alignment there. And that's perfectly fine. Let's go do the other side as well. And it's kind of the same thing. We're just trying to... Now, this in this case, we might want to use the elevation to try to... Yeah, we, we don't really need... We don't really need all this data right here. So we can just maybe pop a point right here. And then we will delete these two. And then we want to delete these guys. And just kind of set it to the edge. Let's just see what opens up. Let's turn this back off so we can kind of see what's opening up. Yeah, let's get rid of this one. And that one looks good. That The rest of those look okay. Now this isn't right. This isn't good. So let's, we, we don't want this coming to a point because this is, this will be grid element number one down here. So we don't want that coming to a point. We want to make that to where there's a a bit of a squared off edge. So we can take this and kind of pull it back until it's going to be a fairly nice square edge. So that grid element number one is now going to be up here somewhere. Now, if you have issues with alignment, there's another tool that you can use, this guy right here. And you can um, identify one of these as a uh, you can see that there are um, a little angle tool to help you direct exactly align things. And you can see up here, once one of these becomes a zero or 90, that's when you're kind of like right in good alignment. So that one's really close, 89, 90, right there. And that's good. That's fine. And we don't really need all this down here. We just need to make sure that we, di we didn't uncover our channel. So let's make sure we didn't uncover our channel. Whoops, wrong domain. Yeah, we have plenty of space down here. We don't need it. We don't, we're not really interested in this spot down here. We're really interested in everything kind of north of the channel or north of the river. And now this one is ready to go. So I'm going to save it. And then what I did with it is I, here, let's turn off a few things so we can see this a little more clearly. I just, um, this is a scratch layer because I didn't save it. So I just click on that and then I just saved this to, I called it the South Domain Clipped, but I'm not going to overwrite that because I've already used it. I'm just letting you know that that's how I did that. I saved that as over uh, South Domain Clipped and it's ready to go. So for now, we'll just un, we'll just turn it off and let's go to the, the next uh, Q uh, Geo Package and QGIS. So you kind of have to start over, right? So in this case, this is my south domain. I'm going to turn these off because we're going to focus now on the south domain boundary. 
or sorry, excuse me, the South Domain Computational Domain. So what I did then here is I took that South Domain Clip shape file that came from the other project and popped it in here. Okay, and you can see that it's the exact alignment. Well, mine's a little different, so that's okay. It's just a little bit different it, on along the edge. That's perfectly fine. But you can see that it's it's just south of the freeway system, and um, and it connects straight into that upstream grid. Then I so I want this high point to be aligned to the grid, and I want this left bank to be kind of uh, straight so that my left grid element number is going is not going to be dangling. And what I mean by dangling, I'm gonna turn the grid on now so that you can understand what I mean by dangling, is that I want grid element number one, let me bring it up real quick. I want grid element number one to have a neighbor to the um, east and a neighbor to the south or a neighbor to the north, you know, it usually doesn't have a neighbor to the north, but it needs a neighbor to the east and a neighbor to the south. So it's not dangling, because if it's dangling, like say let's grid element number one is here because my computational domain came to a sharp point. And so this was all on its own, then it can't, then flow pro.exe cannot calculate the grid cell size correctly, okay? Now, I also made this, just so you can see my elevation, I also made this a out, a down, uh, sorry, a boundary condition. So this is, <clears throat> excuse me, all the flow that comes off this boundary is gonna flow off this boundary in a single spot and that's outside, and then that's down this uh, river valley and down the center of the center line of the channel. That's where the bound, the only boundary, downstream boundary condition we need for this project is right here. Now, the next thing I want to do is to show you the alignment of these two systems. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take, uh, sorry, I need to go back to the North Project. I'm going to take this grid and convert it to a shape file, and then I'm going to import it into the downstream grid. So, um, I mean, I know they match because, I know they match because, um, I did a really good job with that alignment of that polygon, but this will just bring it home and show you exactly why. So this was save features as, and I just take that to here. This is called upstream grid and I save it. And that's just your grid layer. So again, that this is your grid layer from the upstream project, right click, export, save features as, and you need to name it and then save it. I'm gonna cancel out of there because that takes a bit of time and I don't wanna waste your time by processing things. Okay, so we go back to the downstream, the south domain, and we now what we want to do is bring that upstream grid into the project area so that we can overlay them. So I'm going to drag the upstream grid so you can overlay them and see how they connect. So now we definitely want this layer to be under our grid layer. And now what you're going to see is that it's overlapping by about one cell and the alignment looks really good. And we're all, the water's basically mostly flowing in this direction. These guys, these guys right here, oh, I, no, I don't have a selection on, but these guys right here have an outflow condition assigned to them. So as the water flows from north to south in the upstream grid, it's going to come, well, it's not gonna do it right here because it only crosses up in this area, but we're gonna show you this whole process to see how it works. But it, the flow crosses in this area. Let's take a quick look at, let's maybe make this, um, let's take out the, the solid fill there. And now you can see the water crossing the, two, the, the line in the two uh, domains, okay? And, You can see that it that that that's the only place where we need a boundary condition to share water between the two domains is where it's uh, crossing the system. Okay, now let's. So each one of these cells, one, two, three, four, five, etc., will be assigned an outflow condition 
in the other domain. And then these guys right here will be the recipient of that of that boundary condition. Okay, so let's go see how we did that. So, well, I'm sorry, let me, don't let me get ahead of myself. So now that we know the alignment is good, uh, we can finish this grid system. So make sure the alignment is good before you do any more work on the grid system. Now, again, I don't care about end value. I don't care about uh, infiltration. I don't care about anything other than establishing the, the boundary condition between these two domains and getting water to exchange across that system. So I don't want this to run for 24 hours. I want it to run for about 10 hours. Uh, let me get rid of this guy real quick. Okay, so I set up the boundary and I set up the uh, elevation again. That's create the grid and define the elevation. And in this case, I set this little boundary condition right here. Now, if you, I'm going to show you something about polygons and boundaries. So if you have a boundary that can be identified by a polygon, it's really easy to do that with uh, this tool. So I'm going to add a polygon. I'm going to do this and then I'm going to delete it just so that you can see the process. I'm going to add a polygon to a place where I want to have a downstream boundary. It's going to be kind of fake because this is the only place where water exchanges across a grid. But if I did this here and then I right click that and I set that to outflow, click OK, then I click save. What is going to happen when I uh, set this outflow condition as I'm going to, this is outflow one. See, it's set to floodplain and outflow, no hydrograph. I'm going to change that. Uh oh, I lost it. I'm not getting my second boundary condition. Um, that's a bug in this system that's kind of annoying. Well, what you would normally, what you should see right here is an outflow two and uh, also set to floodplain one. And then when you um, hit this tool right here, this is the schematize button. then it's going to define both of these as boundary conditions. Hopefully we'll get to see it. Unfortunately, what, what will not be seen is that it will not be assigned to outflow one. It'll be probably assigned to outflow equals zero. Uh, and so it wouldn't actually become a boundary condition, but you can see, oh, and it didn't, it didn't do the, uh, it didn't do it correctly either. What it was supposed to do was this here. So I'm gonna have to figure that, study that a little bit, but for you, it should work. I think the reason it didn't work for me is because I might have messed something up when I imported those inflow nodes. Yeah, and I think those inflow nodes are also gone now. Yeah, they are. Those inflow nodes are also gone now. So that might have been what, what happened is I broke it. And so what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to find only the cells along here and assign only the cells along here to outflow condition equal to one floodplain, no outflow. So um, let me see if I can, I, I don't, let me just see if I can delete this guy and delete and run that one more time just so that you can see that this one's still working and that one it didn't. It, and it deleted all my inflow nodes too, which is fine. We're gonna show you how to get those back. So uh, we'll go ahead and just let that do its thing. So then you're, what you're going to do now is you're going to export this project because you need the file called cadpoints.dat, okay? So you don't really need anything. You don't, you're not going to run it. You're just going to run it just long enough to generate cadpoints.dat, and that's what we're going to do now. So let me uh, make a folder called, let's just call this south, whoops, cadpoints or just call it South CAD PTS, okay? Because that's all we need out of here is the CAD points.dat file. And the only reason I'm uh, putting it into a new folder, a new uh, directory is because I don't want to overwrite the data from my full my full 20 foot grid run. I don't want to overwrite that data. So I'm going to put it into this one instead, okay? So we'll export that. Uh, well, obviously, the after you set up your grid and calculate your elevation, don't forget also this this is going to go to 10 hours. Output interval, I just set it to 0 
Uh, again, I don't care. It's just testing it. So I don't care if it's not perfect. And then I did actually set this to um, 2 and 0 0.5 so that I could run when my first run goes, it's going to be an animation and time series run. So I'll be able to animate the data that comes out of it in QGIS. I'm gonna cancel that because I've already done it. And then I go here to export GDS. We're going to put that in here. And you'll see that it's just rain, outflow elements, manning's and topo, con.dat, taller.dat. We're gonna go look at those right now. So now we go here to the folder. And this tells us that they're done. So we can now look at them. So um, the, as you can see, there is no con.dat. I'm sorry, there is no CAD points.dat. There is no fplane.dat. We need CAD points.dat. So how do we get that? We run the model. We run the model just until it generates them and then we shut it down, okay? So I have the model here in one of these. This is build 22, that's why it looks like there's a lot of extra stuff here. And I put this in here and then I paste it and then I just run the, the model. As soon as you see the, uh, this, the text screen start to come up, the text right here, you'll know it's ready to go. So right now it's building CAD points.dat, fplane.dat, and it's creating the arrays so that Flow2D can run. We'll just have to wait for it to end. It has uh, 600,000 cells, so it takes a little bit longer than uh, our normal models. While it's running, we can take a look at our south domain. See how our uh, outflow nodes disappeared now and we're reset to that, that's good. And what else was I gonna show you? Oh, um, if you wanna see how many grid elements you have, if you click this guy, and you'll see here that there's 621,000 cells, okay? Just so you know how to get that. You can also tell whether or not you calculated your elevation with this button, because it's going to render your elevation. Ooh, I didn't calculate my elevation. Oh no, I did, okay, good, it's there. It just takes longer because I'm running the model, so it took longer for it to appear and uncheck it. We don't actually care about that right now. Okay, now this is going, so all we have to do is click exit. And to be honest with you, you don't even have to wait for it to exit. You can just come here to your uh, project and you can grab this file right here, CAD points.dat and copy that. That needs to go into, I'm not gonna do it because I don't know if I made a mistake or anything on that, but that needs to go into the north grid. So you can see here, CAD points, but I un, I changed the name of it from DS uh, from CAD points .dat to CAD points DS two dot dat, and I'm going to show you now. We're going to understand why we did that. Okay, so this is done. We don't need that anymore. So we go back to our upstream domain, and let's talk about what we do with our upstream domain. So we know that we um, we set our computational domain to just south of the freeway system. And we, um, and we then used it to cut the other domain. And now we need to run this kind of to completion now that we have that downstream data in it. We also need to define the boundary condition where it's gonna cross. So this is gonna have two boundary conditions. It's gonna have one right here. Again, all of the water is gonna kind of leave this system in one spot. So this is a standard boundary condition with, um, and let me get these guys back in here too. Standard boundary condition right here. You can see that's the red one with floodplain outflow, no hydrograph, normal depth boundary condition. I'm going to change this to the other one, the south domain. And this one is set to outflow with hydrograph. And I set my hydrograph name to O2. So now if you're using build 21, uh, an earlier version of build 21 had a, a bug that uh, did not allocate the O1 array correctly. So that's why I'm using O2 because in case you guys have that version of build 21 that didn't uh, allocate the array correctly, you can 
set it to O2. If you update to the latest build of build 21, which is on your share file account under executables, then you can set it to build to 01. That's perfectly fine. But I'm just letting you know that there is an array allocation problem with 01. You have an option of up to nine different domains that you can exchange with. And this is O, not zero. And it has to be a capital. But QGIS does that for you. Okay, so what you do is you uh, identify the location where the water crosses your domain. And we did that, and I'm sorry, I have the uh, run in the wrong location, the uh, data in the wrong location. So you saw it back here when we, um, when we showed our full domain. And you saw how I used this to identify the location where the water is crossing from the north domain to the south domain. And that is what I used to uh, identify this path. Now look, here's another thing that I want you to notice. Look how thin this line is, this uh, polygon is. We want to assess a few, as few grid elements as possible when we combine these two um, systems or these two layers. Because what the algorithm does, this algorithm that uses the polygon, what it does is it identifies the grid and it, and it takes any, the geometric predicate is any centroid within or any, maybe it's just grid element, maybe it's not centroid, maybe it's any centroid, any grid element that intersects between this domain, or sorry, excuse me, this polygon and the grid element polygon, anyone that intersects is added to the assessment. And then if it is a boundary um, element, meaning that it doesn't have any neighbors in this direction, or it is the end of a row column, it's like the last of a row column, then it will be assigned the boundary. But the more grid elements inside that assessment domain, the longer that's going to take. So what you don't want to do is put this polygon around the whole grid because you want to assess the domain for the whole grid. Okay, you don't want to do that. You want to keep it just along the boundary if you're if you're doing a boundary. And don't do upstream. Don't assign a boundary condition to something up here because you don't need it. The water is going to flow away from that boundary. So you don't need a boundary condition up here to be an outflow boundary. You only need it where the water is going to be naturally leaving the domain. That's the only place where you need a boundary condition. And because this is set to O2, when we export this, the data will look like this. So then we're ready to export this. We have our north domain. North domain is 60 feet. And if we look in our outflow.dat file, we'll see that some of them have just an O, and the O and a one means it's a natural normal depth condition. Some of them have an O2. So this one is going to connect to the CAD points 2.dat file. When the model runs, when the upstream model runs, and any one of these that touches, um, a cell in cadpoints.dat, it's going to then generate an inflow hydrograph for that cell. But check this out. Let's take a look at this grid element number 13076. Okay, Gian, I'm gonna get to your question in a minute. So that's the whole point of this is to develop a better method, but the, uh, but the idea behind it is that we have to understand exactly what it's doing and then we can use that to develop a better method. So I'm gonna to get to your question later. I don't wanna lose my place. Um, so 13076, I'm gonna copy that. And then we will come to uh, here, sorry, come here. And let's, take, let's just find where that is. So use the grid info tool, paste that into there. And that is our very first one along the boundary. So we go to the downstream model and hang on a second. I'm trying to get like kind of an idea of where that is. It's like right as that road is leaving it. So we can kind of uh, uh, see what's happening. Let me get rid of this, turn that back on. And that was, where was that? 
Okay, it's just downstream of this guy. And that's right in here, right in here. So then what's gonna happen is that that is going to overlap one of these guys and it will create three inflow nodes. And any water that passes through that outflow condition will be split into three different inflow nodes just by dividing the, the Q by three. Okay, so what happens is that this, once you run this, once you run this model all the way to 10 hours, you then get this file right here, inflow2 dot, inflow2 underscore ds dot dat. And this, there's a couple of things in this that you don't want, like we don't need that to be 733, you can just turn that off and save it. And uh, if one of these hydrographs is empty, it will not be printed. If they're all, z if all the queues are zeros, it will be removed from the system. So only um, cells that have flow get flow. And these guys, there'll be three of these for every one of these 60 foot outfalls, there'll be three inflows on the downstream model, okay? So then you can take that and rename it. What you wanna do is, or sorry, copy it to the downstream grid. That would be here. And rename it to all caps inflow.dat because now we can import it. And this is what broke my uh, domain, or this is what broke my uh, boundary condition editor was importing this. But if you do it right, it shouldn't break it. So let me get these guys over here and let me just get that out of the way. And what I wanna do is I want to import, sorry, import using the red button and import just a single component. And uh, it's important that this comes from the, nor the south grid because I put it in there. It's important that you make it all caps, I think. Inflow.dat all caps. And then it says it was imported successfully and it's going to convert it to the boundary condition. Now it's gonna tell you to, that you need to complete the system by using the convert schema layers to user layers. And I think that's what I did wrong. So I'm gonna click okay and zoom in on that. And you can see that these are our inflow hydrographs from each of those. But until I um, convert those to the schema layers, you probably you won't be able to see them over here, so that's that's why that is. That's why uh, they're not going to be loading in this table, and that's I think that's why or how I broke um, this guy right here, the digitizing or the uh, schematizing button. That's how I broke that. I don't want to do it though because it could take a long time, and I don't want to waste your time. But that button is right here. Sometimes that button can take a long time because it's not just applying the boundary; it could be applying other things. Okay, so now we have an inflow boundary and this downstream model is, the downstream model, as soon as you get that inflow hydrograph in there, the downstream model is now ready to run. But I've already done that, okay? I've already done it. I've already run it to 10 hours, just like the uh, other two. I already ran all of them to 10 hours. So we have the full, the full runs, the three of them full, fully functional and fully uh, ready to um, analyze. Okay, so let's get rid of a handful of things here. We don't need this anymore. Let's just remove that. And now we can take a look at our full domain. I'm going to maybe get rid of the arrows because they make things a little bit hard to see. So let me get rid of the arrows. Okay, which one has arrows? Oh, I'm on the wrong, sorry. Maybe on the wrong one. Yeah, there we go. And then we can look at the south domain and the north domain. And then what we want to do is make sure, this is kind of important, make sure that the tall is the same on all three and um, the rainfall is the same on all three and the timing is the same on all three. And then when you do that, you can start comparing at a given time because as soon as you start to, let me get rid of this, so I can dock this panel. So as soon as you uh, load these guys, remember these come from the mesh import. So I loaded them and then I named them to identify what I was looking at. So this is the full 50 foot grid. This is the north 
um, 60 foot grid. I'll turn this off. This is the north 60 foot grid. Also going to turn that off, going to turn that off. And this is the south 20 foot grid. And so you can compare them and see the water crossing the boundary and see the water. Um, draining through the system and if you want to like this is a five foot interval so there's certain intervals that at, at, at 30 minutes things really kick in and start happening so be careful about you know um, if you if you think things look funny because they go from like every cell having water right here to things really being drained right here be careful about how you set your um, Whoops, sorry. Be careful about how you set your minimum conditions and things like that because we cut a lot of water out of that. So be aware of that. Just be aware that uh, setting up these colors and making sure all the colors are the same will help you assess this better. Could you quickly go over how you import the animation? This is the first I've ever seen it. Oh, great. I'm glad that you said that, Ryan, because that, that actually, yes, I can I can go over that. Let me see. I'm going to remove the full domain and we'll do it on that one since that one seems to load well the north domain lo also loads faster because it only has it has fewer so I'm going to remove this layer real quick and I'm going to turn the other two off and I'll just do that for you really quickly so um, that's okay here's the key to this when you run one of these projects you need uh, to set this to two or four, I set it to two this time. I think two is appropriate because then you get less data and it, your project's not so big. Because you don't, when you set it to two, you don't actually get the Tim out, which is ASCII data. You only get the HDF5. And then this output interval, it, it depends on you. The smaller you make it, the more, the longer it takes to load the data. So I usually if I'm just doing testing, I usually set it to 0 0.5. If I need to analyze something at a different level, I set it to something smaller than 0 0.5, but I can limit the interval to a specific time frame and then um, save that. Now, I think if you do that, you do need to update to the latest build 21 to get that interval to work because it wasn't around in, uh, maybe it wasn't around in the very early version of build 21. I don't really remember. Okay, then you run it. You have to run it in order to get that uh, animation data, time series data. And that will go into, here's the full grid, and that will go into uh, this guy right here, timdep.hdf5. Back into um, this, sorry, this guy will just be open a data source manager, set it to mesh, uh, set this to, I just always set it to depfp.out it doesn't honestly doesn't matter what you set it to you kind of just need to set it to something in here to identify the, the file location but this is going to become the name of the layer that we're going to load and then you click add and it's going to you'll know that it's done when you see this or you see this you know it's done okay and then once you get it you see here this means that the time data is in there and it's ready to go. I'm gonna just drop a couple of these so we can see this a little bit better. Now, once you get it, you need you need this guy right here. You need this layer styling panel. So you just click this button and that gives you the layer styling panel. And I like to dock it with Flow2D because you need the whole panel. The first, when now you can actually, any, any uh, layer can be in here. So if you lose your panel, remember, just go back here and click the layer you want to edit. Now we don't care so much about the bed elevation. We're more interested in the flow depth. So here's your flow depth, but that's not obviously not the best method to review the flow depth because it's just looks like there's just water everywhere because it's a rainfall model. So you come here and you set this to something like, I think I'm setting it to 0.1. So a tenth of a foot, anything lower than a tenth of a foot, if we use clip out of range values, it'll just get rid of that. 
Um, you can also, now my tall is 0 0.004, so you can also put that to 0 0.01 if you want. That's perfectly fine. And then the max I just leave. This becomes blues. This goes to two, right? Uh, this goes from continuous to equal interval because we don't want 52 classes. That's ridiculous. And this can go to six or eight or whatever. If you do it to eight, then you can just start putting the numbers that you want in here. So this will be 0 0.25 and this will be 0 0.5, 1, 3, 5, 8, and then uh, this one is just the max. And then if you are doing comparisons, you can copy that um, uh, style, copy the style, and you can paste it on the other one so that you're comparing, you know, the exact same uh, data. But you want to take the one with the range, the high, the the highest range. So if you have a max that goes up to like 20, you'll want that to be your max. So again, we go to styles and we paste the styles. And now these two, and we put this one, and I can name it right click and rename or N. And then let's just call this full domain. And then again, I would like to, I typically put that under here. Now this is the key, the part that kind of is not so intuitive if you have the time if you have the clock on these you can use the clock here i'm just going to open it you might need to dock it if your grid info tool is docked here just delete or close the grid info tool and then we click this we go um activate it because nothing's going to be here you activate it with this guy and then you uh set the range with this guy and then once you start to um, use the drag bar, you can pick up the different times. And if you don't like what you're seeing, that's kind of, you can change that to 0 0.01. But of course, then you got to reset all these again, which is kind of a pain in the, in the neck. Uh, so let's just do that real quick. Well, I think that had that to 0 0.25. And you can even turn this into a style. You can export this as a style one. This one was three, five, eight, and that's good. And then you can see that now that I set that to 0 0.01, we're getting um, a little bit more information. Sorry, I didn't mean to zoom in. I meant to take that up. We're getting a little bit more information on our map. So it's not uh, emptying out so quickly because of that uh, minimum clipping or clipping out that minimum range, okay? And then once you get that done, you can start your comparison between the two. Uh, and of course, you know, my full domain and my south domain and now look a lot different because I changed that to 0 0.01. So if you do something like that, don't forget to, um, do that on the other layer too. So style, copy style, paste style. And then same thing here, paste the style. And then of course we're not really paying much attention to that one. And you can also see that my north domain is a little bit different. That's okay. I did change I did change some things on it. Okay. So that's um, that's how you do the comparisons to make sure that the water is crossing the domains and then you can compare to see that it's working correctly. That was kind of the idea of these three layers to show you that it works pretty good. And, and the, uh, the layers, like if I don't focus so much on the south, but I'm looking at the full, that, oops, I, I should, I'm turning off the wrong one, that the, um, the changes in those two layers look pretty close. They're not, they're not bad. And then you can also use the velocity vectors if you want. You can also sh um, show the velocity vectors on those layers if you want to do that too. 
and, and then you could do the uh, the south domain and see the the change in the velocity vectors as you're kind of you know um, reviewing the peak and how the thing and how the water is draining across the grid. I'm not going to do that because we're almost out of time, and I didn't want to. Um, let's see. Okay, I. I, the, I, I just want to make sure that I have everything taken care of. The only thing I wanted to do now was address the questions. So the next step in this is to identify the, the way, let me put this back on the full domain, is to identify the way to do this all in on a single, on a single geo package. And so that's why we're doing this work. First of all, to show you how you can do it now, if you're, especially if you're not a, Q, a QGIS god and you can't write a nice little Python algorithm to split this up um, by yourself because I sure can't so now that this gives you an opportunity to do that and and to make that change without having any issues you know it's easy but the next method will be to identify a system to do this all in a single domain well in a single geo package and the geo packages will split the domain for you and export the data into the correct folders along with the appropriate files. Okay, that, that's kind of the idea. So now I'll go over your questions and um, make sure that we covered everything. So Jeff's poly or Jeff's algorithm that um, JE Fuller created will take the polygons have to be perfectly adjoined, meaning that you basically you you can uh, split them using a splitter and then the vertices will be like connected so just like we did with our difference tool the two vertices were perfectly aligned and perfectly connected and then he uses their algorithm will set up the overlap and uh, calculate the domains at the correct overlap the biggest mistake that people make is they make their overlap based on the larger grid cell size rather than the smaller grid cell size. So they're not, they're overlapping it by multiple grid elements. And so this um, south domain, let me, sorry, let me actually pull up the computational domain. So this south domain is, is getting like three deep inflow nodes. We only want one deep inflow nodes across this boundary, not three deep inflow nodes. So you, your overlap is based on the size of the downstream polygon, not the size of the upstream polygon. I'm sorry, grid cell size, not polygon. And uh, in Jeff's Py Python algorithm that Jeff was talking about also splits out the CAD DS1 CAD, DS2, et cetera. And they usually have more, more than one domain that they're splitting it out to. So if you have more than one domain, let's say we split this into two domains. And so our upstream domain was up here. This would be uh, DS1 and this would be DS2. And you would just have um, to identify that. Let's go back to the upstream grid with this polygon so ds1 would be like say if we split it into two downstream domains because we wanted to use like maybe 10 foot grids down here instead of 20 foot grids then this would be split right here this part of the half of the polygon would be uh oh one and this half of the polygon would be oh two that's that's how that would work for you okay now guion's has um, another procedure that he'd like to talk about. So Guion's, let me just read it real quick before I read it out loud. Yeah. Uh, so this, the method has the drawback where you may need a few iterations to, uh, and using to, uh, um, to connect the boundaries correctly. So his method would be create the whole domain for the study area, use a spatial filter to select each domain from step one, renumber the cells for each domain and output in topo.dat. Uh, he says using dummy elevations, I'm all cool with dummy elevations, that's fine with me. Um, and everything is done with a script. Yeah, and, and that's the key, Guion, is like trying to get that set up for you guys so that you know you don't have to do this manually. So that, that's kind of the idea behind this for the 
2023 development for QGIS. So um, Ian has a question that says, you mentioned earlier that you didn't include infiltration and roughness. If we were to add those to the North Domain, will we need to go through this again in the whole process um, again? So yeah, uh, this is just to test it in to make sure that it's working correctly. But another thing that you could do, you know, you could do the infiltration calculation for like the whole thing, and then you could do table joins or look up or uh, spatial joins to um, uh, to identify that infiltration and pass it to the south domain. But yeah, you can do your infiltration if you want. But this is this is so fast, you know. That's why I didn't mess with infiltration. I just want to do this as quickly as possible to make sure a that it works and B, to show you guys the process. And this just does that really fast. So if you want to do infiltration like that, then absolutely. You could set up uh, the infiltration, the elevation, the end values, all of that in your upper domain before you run it. And that way you wouldn't have to do it twice. But I also only ran it for the 10 hour run, right? I didn't run it for the whole, I didn't run it for the real event which is probably your 100 year event. I only ran it for 10 hours. So it didn't take me, but this upper one only took me uh, like 20 minutes to run it or less. I think it took me like 10 minutes to run it. The lower one took about 20 minutes to run, if that. But again, this is a small project. We're not dealing with 1.5 million elements. So if you're dealing with 1.5 million elements per domain, you might wanna make adjustments to how you approach this based you know based on your speed so thank you for the the question that makes you know that makes sense depending on how big your project is peter when you overlapped the south domain you only moved it where there was a north south overlap not an east west one because basically the water is moving the um the water is mostly moving north to south and when uh, your north grid picks up an outflow um, when your north-south position picks up an outflow, it's going to collect all of the water along this boundary regardless of what's happening. So it's a volume exchange, right? So as long as you get it all, like there's not, there's not going to be a, a an exchange right here. It's all picked up right here. The whole volume is picked up right here. So when I put it into the downstream model, I have the whole volume. Now, is the direction exactly perfect? Probably not, but if you review your, um, if you review your uh, velocity vectors across this, you kind of see that it's mostly crossing the boundary from north to south. Not perfectly, but regardless of where it's crossing or what direction it's crossing, it's getting picked up at that outflow node and passed to the downstream inflow node. Um, and this is a key, Peter, because along these boundaries, you are gonna lose a little bit of that, um, because this is a boundary, right? So you are gonna lose a little bit of that direction cover. Uh, so in Flow2D, you set your boundaries along something that's maybe not super important, or in a place where the water is clearly crossing from one side to the other. That's my kind of my idea behind that. Okay, and I think Jeff just asked answered the exact same question. When you moved to the South Domain, why did you move it due north rather than out of 20 to create an overlap of grid cells? And I think you can test that method. And this is George and Peter have the kind of the same questions. You can test that method all you want and see if it makes differences to the boundary and differences to the flow exchange, go ahead and test it, and then see which one you wanna use based on your testing. I'm not gonna tell you how to do that. I did the movement because it kept the alignment and the alignment makes it a little bit easier for it to identify which grids to set up the exchange for. Um, if you were to move that at a 45 degree angle, you might end up with some inflow nodes that are some cells crossing that boundary that might re have needed an inflow node that didn't get one, but regardless, the whole volume of the event is being passed over the boundary. Re it's just not being passed 
what you guys are paying attention to is the diagonal, whether it's diagonal or straight up and down. What I'm interested in is the is the entire volume cross the border. That's kind of because it's still going to need to reorganize itself, and you know because flow 2D runs in eight directions. So let's see, are we on the right one? So regardless of what's happening, let's go find an inflow node. Oh, did we lose our inflow nodes because I turned this off? Yeah, we did. Okay. So regardless of what's happening, once you have an inflow node, you know, it's it's not really aware of um this is kind of an issue with boundary conditions, is that it's not aware of a momentum. So it's kind of starting over. That's why you try to set them up in a location where uh the water is kind of clearly passing from one domain to the other because it is going to lose that momentum it's going to have to re-establish it at the boundary as it moves downstream that that's an issue with boundary conditions okay let's go to the next one okay and if you are using multiple channels, can you use the same line work and extend them across the two domains? Uh, yeah, I think you could, Peter. I think you could, and just test it. I mean, that's the easiest thing, just test it. Because the uh, multiple domain, the way that the multiple channels uh, feeds the, um, the boundary condition might not be, you know, it's the same thing. You might be losing that um, the multiple channel might be kind of spreading itself out a little bit across the grid element based on the depth. So your downstream multiple channel, again, is going to have to run for a few iterations in order to pick that width back up. You know, that multiple channel automated width in order to pick that back up, still going to have to reestablish that. So you're not, it's not going to be perfect, but it's not a bad methodology because you're still getting the volume. But yeah, you're you're losing your momentum. You're losing like maybe that the capacity of that multiple channel on the downstream side because they do grow as the uh, discharge grows. They do grow uh, in their geometry, those multiple channels. So just test it and see if it's working pretty good. And you'll see that there might be a little bit of funky fluctuation at the start, but then as uh, the flow um, starts moving away from the inflow node that it starts to uh, resume its more natural flow uh, conditions. Okay, good questions, guys. These are excellent questions. Okay, so I guess we don't have any more questions. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now. <laughs>